Welcome to TFR Let's Talk. I am your host, Swapnil Bhartia, and my next guest is once again Gral Piver, CTO at Suza. Gral, it's great to see you again after such a long time. Hey, Swapnil, good to see you again. Today, we are going to talk about a wide range of topics. We are going to talk about, of course, uh, Suza Enterprise Linux uh, 15 SP3, uh, your open uh, campaign, and also your uh, research report on why IT leaders choose uh, open. But let's talk about the topic which is close to, I'm sure, your heart and, of course, my heart, which is um, uh, SLE. So uh, talk a bit about... Uh, SLE 15 SP3, what's new there? You're right, SLE is close to my heart and so is OpenSUSE. So if you look at the new release, you know that there's all the things you would expect. There is uh, increased security, there is support for new chips, so you get 20% more performance, there is increased support for NVIDIA chips, GPU computing, etc. cetera, um, across the board more support, wider support for AR64, so ARM chips from different vendors. So, I mean, a, a broad variety of things that you would expect. Um, a, a little bit more special is, is something, for example, we have done um, together with Google, um, and it is um, having trusted VMs so that you can have VMs on, on GCP, on, on, a, on Google Cloud, um, and and leverage features from um, a modern AMD processor. So really the workload is even more trusted, the, especially the data on the workloads is more trusted. Um, I think it, you know, in times like this where data protection and privacy is more and more um, a topic that people care about, I think that's definitely something to point out. Right, and you touched upon something that I wanted to talk about either way, which is uh, if you do look at a lot of cloud native workloads, security. In early times, security used to be an afterthought. It was someone else's problem. It was never the problem of the developer. Hey, some other silo team will look at it. But now it is kind of becoming part of developers, DevOps, SREs, Dev, DevSecOps, whatever you want to call them is their pipeline. So, and I mean, of course, uh, SUSE Linux or, you know, Linux in general, it's when it's comes to security, you folks do a lot of good job there. But if I want, if I ask you specifically, what security enhancements you have made with SLE? Because if you look at reports, there's still a lot of attacks happening, you know, uh, because everybody is moving to cloud and sometimes they make mistakes. Security is basically either the bugs or misconfiguration. So what are you doing about these two? Yeah, security is not, is not one thing. And it's not, you know, you achieve security and then you're secure. That would be nice, but that's not, that's not reality. So, I mean, step one is you ship products that are secure uh, by default. You know, you, you close all known issues when you ship. You make sure the tech surface is as, as small as possible by, um, uh, by auditing everything that runs a network port, et cetera. But then the other part is that we need to do as a vendor um, is, is the responsive part. So whenever there are new security issues coming up, um, and we learn about them, hopefully via responsible disclosure, so we get a heads up. We work with hardware vendors, other software vendors. Um, we fix them before they, they become public, and, and on, day, on day one, when it becomes public, there is an update ready. Um, but as you mentioned, one key aspect really is how is the system configured? You know, all this, sec all this security that you have in the bits don't help if the customer doesn't have an up, doesn't have the updates. You know, we can create all the updates of the world. If they aren't deployed, that's not helping you. We can create all the security um, options if some systems are configured in an insecure manner, that doesn't help you. And so it's both the system, but also how you manage the system. And, um, and with SUSE Manager, we have actually a solution that manages Linux pretty much across the board. Obviously, SUSE Linux, obviously Open SUSE Linux Enterprise, Open SUSE, but pretty much any relevant um, enterprise and, and community distro. So if you have if you have RHEL, if you have CentOS, if you have Alma Linux, if you have Debian, um, if you have Ubuntu and, and uh, Amazon Linux, um, we help manage those. And then you can get, number one, an overview of what you have actually running, but number two, also push security updates push configuration updates throughout your entire estate. 
since you mentioned Ubuntu and I remember uh, when I used to or talk to like, we have not seen each other for a long time, you know, Richard Brown and all those things, a lot of, you know, OpenSUSE community. And I was like, hey, no, why can't just, you know, I juggle between SLE and OpenSUSE just the way Ubuntu people can be running in their test and move to production. Uh, but now uh, OpenSUSE Leap and SLE, they are, you know, 100% uh, binary compatible. Uh, first of all, uh, I mean, of course, <laughs> uh, I have been like kind of asking or demanding or requesting it for a while, but why you made this decision to bridge the gap between two members of SUSE family, OpenSUSE Leap and SLE? What do you want to achieve with this? Well, I could say because you told us, <laughs> No, literally, because there is a gap and we identified that as a gap. And the gap is how do you move workloads from experimentation to production? How do you move, how do you move skill sets? Um, you know, we did, uh, we did actually um, a survey checking with 800 IT leaders globally. And what we found is one third reported they have staffing shortage or skills shortage. So how if you could make Linux available, um, you know, for free, easily available communities, etc., so that people, universities, in their spare time learn that, and then exactly the same bits, exactly the same skill sets, you can take and apply for a job, you can take it to, to, to work and, and use for SUSE Linux Enterprise, for example. So having this having this open and transparent uh, moving between between community and enterprise side, I think that filling that gap or bridging that gap um, is really what drove this. One thing I also felt was a lot of developers, they develop a lot of their workload on you know, uh, OpenSUSE, and, but moving them in the production on sleep was, I mean, there was a lot of friction there. So that has also become quite easier because you can, because you don't have to, I mean, no offenses, but you don't have to worry about paying subscription fees just for a lot of hundreds of thousands of test machines or, you know, developer machines. You can run all those things and then move your workload into production. So that was a really uh, excellent move there. Uh, personally, this is a personal question. What are you running these days? Me, um, the machine we are using right now is running OpenSUSE Tumbleweed, which is our rolling distro. Um, as, I, as I like to say, I mean, Tumbleweed is more for geeks um, or people really at the forefront of technology. Um, and then OpenSUSE Leap is for family. So that for me is a little bit the segmentation. You want to actively contribute. You have you know, time, skill sets to work on issues. Go for Tumbleweed. It's actually, you see, I use it for production. It's rock solid. Um, we have OpenQA, which does, uh, which comes, which bridges Enterprise and OpenSUSE too. So there's lots of automated tests. Then, you know, for my family, I'm using OpenSUSE Leap because that's, um, that has fewer and smaller updates, but gets all the security as well. So it's very safe and solid. And then, you know, I don't operate a data center. I don't, um, I don't run things myself. I rely on our own IT friends. Um, but if I were, I would go for SUSE Linux Enterprise. I mean, the unique thing about Tumbleweed is like, uh, I used to be an Arch Linux user, but Tumbleweed is like, it, even if it's rolling release, it's fully tested rolling release, which is kind of uh, unique because, you know, it's not, you know, that you're just p pulling packages as maintainers of these packages make them available. You know, here the Steam actually test them and make sure that they are running well. Now, if I want to go back and quickly understand the chemistry between these three, of course, uh, you have Leap, then you have SLE, then you have Tumblebead. Uh, what about factory? Where does the code flow into? And then it finds its way. Like, now, what I do know is that SLE has kind of become, you know, that's where Leap pulls the packages from. But if you can explain the whole chemistry, the workflow. So we have, um, we have this rolling distribution that's called Tumbleweed, and that literally changes every day. There is a new snapshot on average about every other day because I mean, people need to sleep and, and the test test needs to run. Um, and you mentioned factory. Those are near synonyms because factory is actually a bigger pool. Things like um, micro S um, and, and a couple of other open source projects actually all go into factory. So factory is even bigger than the Tumbleweed release, but it's think of a stream and then some side arms, if you will, or, or a broader stream. So that's the constant 
flow, the constant innovation that happens um, with upstream being integrated, new compilers pushed in, um, lots of desktop environments. I mean, it's really living. It's living, but it's not random because there is there is all the automated quality assurance that's happening and there is very skillful release management. And then usually every couple of years, we use that as a base to branch SUSE Linux Enterprise. And you know, that, that gets then the full force um, the full attention of, of a large part of SUSE engineering, where we do intense amounts of QA, supported by partners, large groups of beta testers. So we really uh, put that then into more extreme use cases, even your scalability, 72-hour tests, etc. cetera. Um, and, and so Tumbleweed is the, ma is the mother plus father plus whole family, if you want. Um, and similarly, what, um, what happens then is we take the flow that's tumbleweed and we take the stability that's still a flow, but a little bit more carefully curated that SUSE Linux Enterprise, and we combine those two. And that's open SUSE Leap. So that's sometimes I call it a two layer cake where the base comes from the enterprise side, you know, kernel, glibc, tool chain, and then the sprinkles like five additional desktop environments and lots of additional packages, components, comes from, comes from Tumbleweed. And then that forms OpenSUSE Leap. So that's a little in between um, the free flow that Tumbleweed is and, and the stability um, that, that the enterprise provides. What I would like to mention actually about Leap is that, the, I mean, it, when we talk about compatibility, it really is... I'm making up the word identicality, right? So it's the same binary components, half of which come from the enterprise, half of which come from the from the um, OpenSUSE, from the Tumbleweed side. And and one of the things that we added actually in the new release is support for the mainframe. So if you want to run OpenSUSE on Z, that's actually supported too. Um, and you even get Kubernetes now. And our, our friends and, and new colleagues from Rancher that are now SUSE um, actually are, are adding Rancher support. So full Kubernetes management um, for System Z as well. Yeah, since you mentioned Rancher. So there are a couple of things that I want to talk about. Number one is that, you know, uh, if I'm not wrong, I think they have K3S. Uh, and uh, SUSE, you folks had something called, I think, Micro, K, uh, Micro OS, then it was rebranded. OpenSUSE community, they also have OpenSUSE Cubic, which is for Kubernetes. Uh, they also have a lightweight distribution. So uh, if you look at all these projects, they're all open source projects. Uh, what kind of roadmap do you see for these projects, which kind of overlaps each other? Uh, now, Rancher and SUSE are same teams, uh, but there is a user base for each project. So can you share anything about it if you can? Yeah, if you look at, if you look at the Kubernetes side, um, you're right, there is Cubic, um, which, which is a certified um, CNCF certified distribution. And I see that going ahead. Um, I mean, Richard, who is the main driver, he's, he's really skillfully developing that. And, and that's one way to push innovation. Um, what, what we are doing is, is really, I think, um, I personally consider very exciting, is giving more attention to K3S. Because K3S is a full-fledged Kubernetes distribution, and yet it's small enough that you can easily deploy on, on actually I did it, I tried it, um, on my own notebook um, or you know, on satellites. So there is actually K3S going into space um, and for edge devices. And one of the things we have been looking into for the last year or two, and interesting both on the what used to be SUSE and what used to be Rancher side is edge. And so now we are taking micro S that you mentioned, and we're taking K3S and we're bringing those together um, and pushing it for, for edge use cases. Um, and, and so you have the best of both worlds. You have a really adaptable Linux. You have, um, you have a micro OS, which, which, which provides benefits like a rock solid update, immutable platform, et cetera. And then you have very, um, low resource requirements that K3S brings, but the full resilience on both parts and playing that together. 
Um, so that's, um, that's, that's one of the things we're working on. And then on top of that, scaling. Um, that means scale on cloud, everyone talks about that, but we have the same scaling on edge because if you look at the size of edge devices and the increasing pervasiveness, we aren't talking about 100 devices. We aren't talking about 1,000 devices. We're talking about setups where people want to run hundreds of thousands of devices. And now, how do you manage that, both on the Linux side, classically, but also on the Kubernetes side? That's, um, I mean, that's a, where a lot of brain, uh, brain work goes into these days. Right, and since you mentioned Edge, uh, when we look at Edge, uh, there are two ways we can look at it. Number one is we can look at IoT devices, which are like small devices, sensors, all those things. And second is we are also talking about edge data centers where you know you have you know resource constraint divide near the user. So when you talk about edge, either from Rancher or Sousa's perspective, which edge are you talking about? Both. <laughs> Be because we see that we see. Sometimes you call it near edge, or far edge, for example. But but we see the needs of both. And there are some, um, there are many characteristics that, that are shared. You know, there is the scale, there is the security requirements, there's the availability requirements, um, there is how do you update, how do you update in the absence of a very reliable infrastructure? You know, no matter of how rock solid the software is, or maybe even the devices are, um, if you have an ATM somewhere you know, in the Amazonas or, or devices in, in space where you have a connection to the base station like two minutes every hour, um, that poses new challenges. But, but those challenges are shared. So there is, a lot, there is a lot of commonalities, which means what we improve here, what we innovate here, usually benefits on the other side or one of the other sides as well. One thing more about Sousa is that you folks uh, stress a lot on partnership. You don't like to go alone. You always work with partners. So uh, can you talk about as you folks are evolving, um, especially after the acquisition of Rancher, how much has that strategy changed? How much are you still collaborating? First of all, Sousa does so many things, so it's actually hard. You're not just a single vendor doing a single thing. So talk about the importance of openness and collaboration. Uh, so that your solution reach to your customers. Yeah, I mean, we are we are an open source company, and and for us, open source isn't just about the license. Um, open source is really the bigger concept of being open, and so working with partners um, is key. But who are partners? You know, um, communities are partners, like we talked about OpenSUSE. But there is also actually very very strong, very vivid communities around uh, on the rancher side. Um, there is hardware partners. There is there's tons of ISVs. Um, there is consulting partners, um, and, and last but not least, um, there is cloud service providers. So um, I think it's fair to say nothing actually has changed. If anything, we are now managing to bring Rancher to to a broader set of partners, to a broader set of of ecosystems, and really benefit. Because we have had some partners in common or many partners in common, but there is also some where SUSE has had a long history um, where we can connect the colleagues from the rancher side and vice versa. So, um, you know, when we talk about openness, it's really having an open mind, but also driving innovation together. Um, so listening, um, but not just listening and then doing something, but doing something together. For me, that's that's really the gist of open source. Since now we are talking about open uh, open source, and uh, thanks for actually talking about the aspect of open source. Sometimes we get so much caught up with the source code that we also forget that you can also create vendor lock-in with open source as well. You know, if you are the only sole vendor controlling a lot of things. So talking about the openness is also as important as it is. Now the interesting thing that is happening in today's world, especially if you look at cloud native technology, most of these are open source technologies. But at the same time, we do see little here and there, which has been happening all around where some companies are struggling. They are trying to 
change their licenses to compete in the market. So can you talk about the importance of open, which means both openness is open source code base plus open approach to partnership in today's world, especially where a lot of things are running in the cloud. So, so talk about the importance of open source and what is Suze doing there? The thing I think that comes immediately to mind if you talk open source is innovation. If, if you talk innovation and you look, look around then you know, a majority of innovation in infrastructure, just look at containers, um, look at edge is actually coming from open source. And so, um, you know, now and then we at SUSE, we do a, we do a survey just to, to make sure we get um, a neutral assessment of the market and, and of, of partners. And it's, um, it just came out actually here in June I reading, I just read this over a weekend here, here you've got the report. Um, and what I found interesting is um, of 800 people that were queried, um, and those were IT leaders, um, a, more than 80% really said open source is leading innovation at the edge. Um, and I think it was only 79 only, I mean, it's a vast majority, um, that, that said they want to actually use from proprietary to open source wherever possible. So what it means is there is a strong drive among users, among customers to move towards open source and move towards the innovation that comes from there. Um, and I see some um, you know, aspects, not just in technology, but one of the things that did surprise me a little looking at the numbers is about a third of people said skill set is a problem for them in, in, the, in the labor market. And so I think if we manage to spread open source, if you, you know, beat OpenSUSE, beat Rancher, it's all free. You can download it, um, OpenSUSE.org or GitHub um, and other places. Or you want to learn Kubernetes, K3S, put it on your notebook. It installs in, in like half half a minute or so, you can do that. Um, and then that increases your value if you're you know, fresh out of college or so, that increases your value, value in the labor market. But also if you're an employer, um, giving exposure to your, to your employees, to your engineers is actually easier than it's ever, ever before. And you know, the openness is obviously on the business side. How do you conduct business? Do you lock in people? Or do you really face people face to face at the same level as peers? But it's also on the community side because, you know, Swapnil, if you want to, to use K3S, for example, or OpenSUSE, and you have any questions, you can reach out. And with a bit of luck, you get actually response from the developers themselves, you know, the people who wrote the software, which you wouldn't very likely get from, you know, one of the proprietary companies because there, there, you know, there is this shielding. So openness, I think, is very, is very pervasive. It's how you conduct business, how you drive innovation, um, but also individually how you engage, how you connect with, you know, people to people. Right. Uh, one more question before we wrap this up is since you did mention the the importance of you know the the, the there's a gap in supply and demand of talented people in this space. Um, can you talk about the efforts that are that you are making? Yes, it's easy to go and download and learn on your own, but if you are going to run any of the system in production, you need to have validated, verified skill sets. So there are a lot of you know training goes on. There are a lot of certification goes on. Uh, Suza and Ranger, you folks also created a Suza Ranger community to help users, and the Ranger also has something called Ranger Academy. So can you talk about some of the efforts that are going on there to help these people? Because learning yourself is easy, <laughs> but getting trained and be certified or be qualified to run something in production is different. And just that will be our wrap up question. So if you can answer that. Yeah, I mean, you, 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 you put it very nicely. It's, it's, it's actually something we are putting, we started to put more and more effort over, over the years is not just to provide training, which we have, we have done for code forever, um, not just to provide communities and you know, forums, et cetera, which we have done forever, but make, make things more accessible. So have things like Rancher has been doing something called Rodeo, where you get access to people where, where new technologies are previewed, you can interact. 
And then there are really formal um, training programs, like um, I think there's one on Udacity, for example, where we invite people and you can train and maybe later you can certify. So it's at all levels, the commercial level, if you if you want instructor-led training, that's available. If you want to do online training, that's available. If you just want to dip into a community and interact on, you know, on an issue that you have um, on forums, we have OpenSUSE forums, there is SUSE forums. So there's... There is a lot of different um, places, I would call them, where you can connect. Um, and, and luckily, technology really is helping us. So there is not one way. There is many ways. And you pick depending on your personal preferences, um, on, on, on your per personal learning style, on your inter interaction style. Um, it's your choice. And you can learn at your own speed. Um, or just use, you know, that's also an option. You you can learn proactively and achieve certification or you just learn whatever you need to solve the challenge that's at hand, like set up your notebook. Once it's running, you're fine. Gerald, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk to me about so many topics, so many topics that are close to my heart, I'm sure your heart too. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you. Totally, anytime. <laughs> Thanks, it was uh, great meeting you.